Uh, good morning, participants. Um, this is James Diamond speaking. I'm the team leader for an oil and gas team in Environment and Climate Change Canada. And, and today, here in front of you is the co-chair of the subcommittee, oil and gas subcommittee in the Global Methane Initiative. Um, got an uh, exciting 90 minutes to continue a series of webinars that we've been um, carrying through the, through the past year, um, connecting virtually with as many people as we can, following on the, the Global Methane Forum that didn't proceed as as planned last year um, and and I think um, I'm going to run through a very few slides at the beginning of this presentation just to you know, remind people of, of who we are and why we're here but uh, quickly get to the to the heart of the presentation today with some interesting technical solutions that are the heart of what we're trying to do with the subcommittee uh, I just remind everybody at the beginning now, as we start running this, um, please mute your microphones. Um, if you're participating by phone, star six, we'll mute your phone. Um, we'll have people monitoring the the chat and, and you'll be able to raise your hand if you want to make an intervention and ask questions, but there will be periods through the agenda where we can uh, have engagement by the, by the audience. The agenda today, um, as I said, follows a series of, of webinars we've been having, really trying to focus on solutions to methane emission controls um, for the oil and gas sector in particular. Uh, Jonathan will run through the, the uh, introduction to the specific presentations that are coming later. Um, we'll be running for about 90 minutes uh, with some time for discussion uh, toward the end of the, of the meeting today. I said that I'd quickly pass through some, some background materials. This is as much for the reference material. If you, somebody picks up this presentation uh, after the meeting, um, who are we, the Global Methane Initiative, and, and what brings us together today? Um, as much as anything else, I think we're looking at you know, this concept of a project network member that's over 700 people uh, strong, um, making the connections between the, the solutions that are available and the, and the the industry that needs those solutions. In terms of uh, where we sit in the structure of, of the GMI, we're, we're in the middle blue box at the, at the top of the screen, the oil and gas subcommittee. There's other activity going on uh, to, to be aware of, um, but you know, structurally, I, I think we've got, um, as you'll see in the next slide, you know, the, the most substantial emissions to deal with on a global basis and on a country basis, you'll see a very di different distribution there. So in some Cases like um, mine in Canada, um, the oil and gas operations are really the, the focal point for, for emission reductions to make substantial change. I also want to draw attention at the beginning of this presentation, rather than lose at the end, to a couple of pieces that are happening. Um, the Global Methane Challenge continues, an opportunity for those of you who've got solutions to promote them. Uh, information is available then on, on the websites on the GMI, uh, allowing us to make connections again, showing the uh, activity that's going on out there and, and, and the growth has been uh, incredible in this over the past year, a great clearinghouse for, for materials and, and, and networks to demonstrate the, the work that's going on to find solutions over the past few years in particular. It remains open, uh, and certainly if you're interested, you can reach it through the through the globalmethane.org challenge website. So, and a very easy process. Uh, reach out to any of us if, uh, if if there's any problems. And lastly, I just wanted to stop uh, my part of the presentation by a reminder of kind of what's going on within the subcommittee itself. Um, so our our focal point this year uh, includes some online training resources that uh, will be accessible to you all around design and implementation of LDAR programs and identification and development of methane mitigation projects. And, and all of that's going to be accessible through a revamp of the GMI website that you should see uh, imminently uh, hours or days away. Uh, and so with that couple of minutes of introduction, um, again, thank you for, uh, everyone for, for attending. Uh, I was Attending a meeting, uh, coincidentally, uh, to my knowledge, with Jonathan yesterday, uh, organized by the International Energy Agency, and I was taken by one of the comments he made during his presentation there about, you know, this being a big issue, but a relatively small community. And so we are seeing each other and have over the past um, five, five 
five, six, seven years uh, in so many different venues as, as we've made progress on, on the solutions coming forward for methane emission reductions, particularly in the oil and gas sector. So we, we remain a pretty small community, I think, notwithstanding that we're um, bringing together <clears throat> hundreds of people through various meetings like this. Um, so it's it's uh, good to see Jonathan again. Uh, he was uh, instrumental in in some work here in Canada, as we work through policy policy solutions for for regulations for the oil and gas sector, uh, and and continues that work elsewhere. So I'll turn it over to you now, Jonathan. Uh, if you'll pick up the presentation and introduce the, the rest of the the meeting. Sure. Thanks, James. Um, so. Um, thanks everybody for getting on today. I'm going to do a brief introduction um, to begin and then uh, I'll um, introduce uh, our speakers. Um, my name's Jonathan Banks. I'm with the Clean Air Task Force. I'm the International Director for Methane um, and I've been with the Clean Air Task Force for 21 years and have for a long time now worked uh, pretty much exclusively on trying to reduce emissions and methane from the oil and gas sector around the world. And I lead our projects in Canada, Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, Nigeria, and the European Union, uh, which is currently where we're, uh, we have existing projects working. You know, our, um, our focus on this is is really about um, uh, the methane issue, um, and you know a lot of you guys know this. You know why methane? Uh, why should we be worried about it? There's a lot of reasons to worry about methane. We're primarily focused on methane because of the climate impacts. But there's all sorts of uh, public health impacts associated with uh, gas that is uh, leaking to the atmosphere and the air toxics that come along with it and the VOCs. Um, but methane, from a climate perspective, um, we see the potential for um, deep reductions in, in methane equivalent to shutting down um, 1,700 coal-fired power plants by 2030. Um, that's a lot of emissions. Um, it has the real potential to slow the rate of warming that we are experiencing currently. And as we've seen from uh, the latest uh, UNEP report, uh, the emissions gap report that came out a couple of weeks ago, we're really nowhere on track for meeting our climate goals. Uh, so getting uh, these kinds of relatively simple reductions from the oil and gas sector on methane are critical to getting us back on the path to meet our uh, target of um, uh, curtailing global warming emissions. Um, so I I know we're here to talk about methane mitigation and um, I th the images here are so some of you would probably not classify them as methane mitigation. They're they're more along the lines of methane detection. Of course, detection and mitigation go hand in hand. But I throw them up here um, as you know, kind of a, a sign of how things have changed in the methane mitigation and methane detection world. I mean, it's, the technology for both has come so, so far. Uh, you think back, you know, to the beginning of Natural Gas Star, you know, back in 1993, and you think about how far things have come. I and mean, when you look at at the uh, the methane detection side of things, which tends to get a lot more attention than the methane mitigation side of things, I, I think partly because it's dealing with sexy things like satellites and drones and and fancy cameras. Um, you know, when you think about how far that side of the equation has come, you know, the, it wasn't too long ago that the natural way to go out and look for leaks was a sophisticated technique called AVO, audio, audio visual and olfactory, meaning you go out, you look, you listen, you smell for something that typically doesn't have a smell uh, and doesn't make a sound and you can't see it. So it's not not necessarily the most sophisticated system of finding oil and gas leaks. Um, the uh, the technology has come, you know, on leak detection and technology has come so far, you know, with uh, optical gas imaging and drones and satellites, drive-by technologies, et cetera. Um, on the mitigation side of things, um, 
today we're going to hear about you know some technologies that you know, don't get the um, the headlines that um, that satellites get or anything like that but are equally uh, advancing the, um, the mitigation side of the equation when it comes to methane emissions. So I think, um, I think uh, I'm really excited to, uh, to hear about what uh, the speakers are gonna talk about today. We've got a really good panel here. Um, the, um, the first, let's see, um, first one up is um, Sean Garceau from Solar Turbines. Then we have Jay Misty, uh, also uh, Misty from Solar Turbines as well, and Doug Son from TP Midstream. Um, I will uh, introduce each of them uh, as we get to them. So let's start with Sean. Sean's again with Solar Turbines. He spent 14 years in the oil and gas industry um, with Solar Turbines. He's currently focused on methane emissions from compressors. In addition, Sean is Solar Turbine's lead on turbo machinery package fuel systems. Prior to his current roles, Sean was Solar Turbine's subject matter expert on compressor systems with a focus on dry seals, wet seals, and process control. Sean graduated from Missouri University uh, with a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering and the University of Louisville uh, with a Master of Science in Engineering Management. Sean, if you want to take control and go ahead. All right, thank you very much, Jonathan, for the uh, opening statements. Uh, I'm going to take you through uh, about 20 minutes presentation here about solar turbines, uh, methane emission reduction, reduction systems and solutions uh, that we uh, have developed and have uh, installed around the world. So we can all kind of look and start out, you know, what are some of the objectives of the Global Methane Initiative? And there's two major areas that uh, we kind of come and think about when you're looking at uh, compressors that are running with tandem dry seals. Um, one of the first areas uh, is the pipeline blowdowns, and this is the gas located between the suction and discharge valve um, of a compressor. Um, this is kind of outlined in some of the United Nations reports that lists a, a, a large group of different areas uh, to mitigate uh, methane emissions, um, and I've outlined a table uh, here is some of the uh, recommendations that came out, but it can be condensed kind of into four major uh, applications, which is inline compression, mobile compression, uh, transferring gas to low pressure systems, or just providing some stops in the system. Um, and so when we look at a station level uh, or a single unit level, kind of the combination of a mobile compression uh, solution, uh, though uh, as outlined in the, in the report, that's quite high, high horsepower compared to what you'd want at a facility. Um, and also the low pressure system uh, combination. So if you kind of find a medium between these two, um, there's a lot of uh, room for integration into a, a pipeline facility. Uh, the second area that's kind of not as much in the, in the uh, report by the United Nations, uh, but is very applicable to the current landscape uh, is the emissions from the primary dry seal vents. Uh, if you are running for uh, long periods of time, um, you will have emissions and those can add up over time. And the actual Canadian methane rule has uh, come up and started being implemented uh, with full transition in about 2023, which kind of addresses the dry uh, seal primary events. So these are two key areas of focus uh, for mitigating uh, methane in uh, pipeline and even gas gathering applications. Of course, we have to be concerned and uh, note of both when we're doing these things, what's the economic benefit as well as the social benefit. And these two are kind of sometimes tied uh, together. Really, we, and we see um, both regional, uh, provincial, or even good neighbor policies that need to be implemented uh, in order to get some air permits or any other activities. And even internal to various uh, companies, they have uh, their own initiatives uh, and assign value to the reduction of methane. 
So when Solutrins started uh, our journey with our customers into reducing uh, methane, we kind of look at it several different pillars um, into how we develop a product. To, uh, and this is kind of the voice of the customer. Um, and this is kind of the beginning of our, our story and our customer's story of our, our products and its history. And so we are, of course, looking to reduce the uh, gas. We're trying to drive to a, a near zero emissions level in the two uh, mentioned areas, which is uh, the gas, the process gas, as well as the dry seal gas. Uh, definitely minimize the number of blowdown events that we have. Solar started its journey with with this uh, and, our, and with our customers with introducing electric uh, steel gas boosters for longer pressurized hold, but that's not a, a enough. We want to address the non-emergency events um, that occur and for various maintenance activities. And as I noted previously, there's always a cost savings benefit that has to be a value evaluated. Um, and the last item that we heard is uh, always having a support and we wanted to, to develop a product that had uh, a lot of the uh, support from solar had a lot of common parts with their turbo machinery package uh, in order to uh, reduce any downtime or have a lower amount of inventory so now uh, looking at uh, the dry uh, seals and when they uh, are dynamically operating, uh, then they will be um, sitting about somewhere around 2 to 12 SCFM out of their primary events. And so this gas can be captured over a long period of time um, and be uh, sent to a different location and be used for various sources. As I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, slides, the other area that we're going to focus on through this conversation is the gas between the uh, su suction and discharge. Now the flow rates uh, out of the primary dry seals is variable um, depending on the compressor shaft size, its operating pressure, and so we have to address those areas and concerns through our designs. So Solar Service's first uh, kind of product in this, this area was we did more of an enclosed burner design where we destructively uh, burnt the methane um, out of the primary vents, and we used an accumulation system to kind of be the buffer between the compressor dry seals and the burning system. Uh, we have a, a, an installation of this design in the field, um, and, and it's out there, and it was a really good way of understanding um, the system, and this is beneficial for a lot of customers that aren't, uh, that can still burn the gas, but, but is uh, don't need to send the gas somewhere else. So they're making that incremental improvement from pure uh, natural gas release to atmosphere uh, to more of a, a full zero uh, net emissions. So after learning a lot of uh, information from that burner system, uh, so they moved to the dry seal recompression system uh, design. And what we uh, did here is we said, okay, uh, we're going to collect the same amount of gas, uh, but we want to drive to a near zero emissions uh, during full dynamic operation of the turbo machinery package. And there's a lot of available uh, sources in which to put that gas. And so if, uh, if we would take the gas, we pump the uh, gas up, and so it can be injected into the station suction or discharge header. Uh, it can be used as uh, part of the fuel gas supply line or any other auxiliary system. Uh, that is in place. Uh, now, as I, I mentioned uh, previously too, there's a lot of variability in flow rate from the dry seals. And so in order to address that um, issue, uh, we have two different sizes of compressors that we use in the recompression system. Um, so, so for lower pressure applications, smaller compressors, you have one size. If you're having a lot larger shaft machines and higher pressures, it'll be another. In addition, uh, we can connect multiple units or turbo machinery packages uh, into single uh, into a single recompression system, and this helps reduce you know capex and opex associated with the, the pro uh, product. Uh, now, addressing the blowdowns applications, um, we we kind of took the the dry seal recompression system and we upscaled it um, here. And we focus on, uh, you know, trying to reduce the, the amount of time it takes to take a very large quantity of gas 
um, and decompress it to a pressure below 30 PSIG. Um, now, this is a very beneficial during non-emergency applications, and we can inject the, the gas that's being pumped up uh, again into a station suction or discharge header. Now, fuel gas can be used if you have a, a station that is kind of running in an N plus one configuration and the other units uh, are uh, running at that time. But very common, what we see with uh, our customers is that the gas will be sent to the, uh, the suction or discharge header in this application. As noted by the line uh, diagram here, uh, we do have a conditioning system uh, and this is used uh, to uh, regulate the, uh, the pressure appropriately to, for uh, injection into the recompression system, uh, as well as if sites uh, have some gas that is heavier in uh, uh, hydrocarbons, uh, we have some conditioning there so that we don't impact the availability and, um, and reduce the maintenance cycle of the recompression system. Uh, the final kind of uh, grouping uh, is actually the combination. Uh, so we've uh, looked at the two previous items and we looked, there's a lot of commonality. And so, you know, to again, help customers reduce that initial uh, CapEx and OpEx uh, uh, expenditures, and then really get a better rate of return on, on their um, investment with regards to methane emissions reductions. Uh, you can combine the two systems so that when a turbo machinery package is uh, dynamically operating, the gas will flow through the accumulator system in the recompression system. And then when the package decides to be shut down, it may be put in pressurized hole for a period of time. And then eventually blowdowns will be uh, wanted. And so you could then uh, send the ga uh, gas between those suction discharge valves to the recompression system. So great uh, opportunity to use both systems into one. There are some additional benefits I'd like to talk about um, with uh, the system here. Um, one of the key items is it has a, a lot of system diagnostics associated with it. Um, it was designed with the intent to really design uh, for any site around the uh, world uh, and especially supporting remote sites. So it has an automatic operation with the turbo machinery packages that are, are in site through very few discrete signals um, between the two. And so uh, operator intervention is not uh, required. Uh, it does have its own HMI and real system time monitoring. Um, so uh, for customers who want to connect and gather their own information about the performance, how much CO2 equivalency they are capturing with the run rates. That's all available uh, to them through this system. And actually on the HMI, we do do daily totalizers with the CO2 equivalencies um, in it. And as I noted in the very beginning of the presentation, many of the parts that we use are similar to our turbo machinery parts. Uh, and again, this was done to help reduce inventory as well as when customers, if they have a solar turbines package, they, they've seen these parts and it's uh, not as, uh, it's very familiar to them and how uh, each individual component would work. And then uh, they're just then learning about the totality of the, the total uh, package. Now we do offer um, this uh, system integrated into the individual turbo machinery package if desired, especially in opportunities where the uh, you have one, I'll say, recompression system is connected to a single turbo machinery package. Um, and as uh, shown in the picture here, this is one of our installation size for our process event recompression system uh, outside, and it will be part of one of our case studies that I'll go to uh, in the coming slides. So I have two case studies I would like to talk to uh, you about. Uh, the first one is at Berkshire Hathaway Energy Company in Pennsylvania in the United States. Uh, this site was installed with uh, the customer, a dry steel recompression system on a solar steel uh, C40 compressor that's operating normally between 800 to 1000 PSIG. Uh, one of the great benefits of the system is we are actually able to monitor the real time emissions from the compressor dry seals. Uh, and we've been uh, working to and achieving uh, net zero emissions uh, from this system. 
Uh, hopefully the long term journey will be able to connect multiple units at this site, uh, but over the last uh, a, a year or more, uh, we've been working with the customer, collecting uh, data, and it's been a great opportunity and success. At the site also, we have the process vent recompression system. Uh, and here the uh, pressurized soil normally lands somewhere around 800 to 1,000 PSIG on unit, depending on the day and how they're operating the unit. And we have uh, successfully pulled the case pressure to below 30 PSIG uh, at this site. Uh, and so that's a very uh, great reduction. I mean, that's somewhere around 97% of the methane is being um, recaptured uh, and at this site sent to the suction header of the station. Uh, the second case study here is uh, working with Williams in Virginia. It's actually two stations. Um, one station went operational in 2020. And we're here, we're connecting two turbo machine uh, packages. These are larger in the compressor sizes for the solar family. Uh, and we start around 600 PSIG, and again, pull it to about 30 PSIG um, for the turbo machine package uh, vents the system. Uh, as shown here, this is an outside installation. So we have an enclosure uh, for the unit. And one of the great uh, items with this was we were able to, to prove that with the enclosure, our noise levels were somewhere between 76 to 78 decibels at one meter. Um, the objective was to keep it under 85. We achieved that. But what's also another uh, great finding from this is at those levels, normally you're not having to uh, redo any noise limits or permits uh, because it is quite low. And kind of the other social side other than emissions is noise. And so this really helps with the noise levels when you're installing the equipment. So a couple of snapshots uh, over the product and uh, just want to view a couple of key features here. Um, we have a lot of more information and a couple of product information letters, which will go over weight, sizes, and utilities. Uh, and those are always uh, available um, to our customers or if you inquire about it. Uh, and they're uh, a great source of information. Uh, but again, both of these systems that I've outlined here are definitely driving to that near zero uh, level, both the dry seal and the process uh, event systems. And we've seen that through the data that we've collected with sites that we've installed the equipment. Uh, we have designed the product for installation worldwide. So uh, we have uh, it designed for NEC or CEC class one division two areas or ATEC zone two. We use a lot of division one and division and zone one components. Um, we can meet IECX when requested. Uh, so um, we, as I highlighted two case studies in the US, but we do have installations in, in Europe and we have an ongoing installation in Canada at this time. And just again, review, we've designed it uh, so that you as the user um, understand uh, what you're capturing, you can validate the uh, rate of return and how much methane you're capturing uh, through the system. And so all that analytics, I think is gonna be very important for the industry uh, as we continue to say, you know, we are doing uh, steps to reduce methane and then we can uh, show how much we're actually uh, reducing and, uh, and trend that over time. So I wanted to say thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to present to you about uh, the information that we have and a few case studies, and I'll turn it over uh, to Jonathan to uh, introduce our next presenter. Thank you, Sean. That's that's fantastic. Um, our next uh, presenter is also for from Solar Turbines, uh, Jay Mystery. Jay spent uh, 30 years in the oil and gas industry with exposure to upstream, midstream, and downstream sectors. He's currently the mobile turbo machinery and EMD compressor business manager at Solar Turbines. Prior to Solar Turbines, Jay worked for six years at Siemens industry with responsibilities for the power businesses, including VFDs and motors. In this role, he worked with Solar Turbines to develop a standard EMD offering for compressors. Before Siemens, he worked for 19 years at Rockwell Automation, Alan Bradley, in various sales and marketing leadership roles. Jay graduated from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo with a Bachelor of Science degree in Electronic Engineering 
Jay, the floor is yours if you want to take control and go ahead. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. All right. All right. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone uh, that's on the call. Uh, appreciate the uh, you participating in this and uh, want to uh, provide some information on uh, what we can do with uh, with uh, methane that's uh, created with uh, what we call associated gas, which I'll get into. Um, uh, I appreciate the time. I do want to talk about how we can um, uh, not only what Sean talked about, which was uh, methane uh, 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 fugitive gas uh, reduction, but also what we can do with gas that comes out that uh, that is that is frankly a byproduct, if you want to call it, for oil production. So that's uh, what we're going to really get into in this uh, presentation. So here is a chart that shows the amount of gas flaring that goes on um, in it's pr primarily in uh, in the U.S. This is this data is for the U.S. But this shows you over a span of like uh, looks like just about three years here. Uh, you can see the amount of emissions uh, or the amount of flaring that's that's happened. And there was a peak in the uh, the late uh, the fall of 2019, if you will, which is what's uh, what's shown on the screen here. And you, in this case, you can see it's 1.4 billion uh, cubic feet uh, per day. All right, which is which is significant. So this is just the different the, the different colors represent the different uh, uh, areas that uh, where this gas was coming from, and uh, again, uh, primarily in the north uh, uh, in uh, in the U.S. Um, there is some data available for Canada and other parts of the world that unfortunately we weren't able to get, but this this is very exemplary of uh, what's been going on from a global standpoint as well. All right. So, what is this? What is this really showing? This is showing that this this much methane that's being uh, 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 that's coming out of the ground, and for various reasons, whether the infrastructure is not there, it's it's not uh, uh, usable per se for the the, um, the 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 customer to pull this out of the you know to do anything with this they have to flare it. It's better than releasing, you know, raw methane into the air. And even with flaring, there's debate. There's debate about how much is actually, uh, you know, consumed, that's actually burned off. There's there's debate that there's a certain percentage, even with burn off, that uh, escapes. And so you have you have this raw methane that gets out into, uh, into the atmosphere. So it, I think uh, we can collectively agree that, you know, raw methane is, is not, uh, desirable at all as we as, as the reason why we're having this uh, presentation and discussion but it also it also talks about hey you know what else we you know what can we do with it if it if we can't if we can somehow find a way to avoid flaring it and that's what we want to talk about here so again you can see the peak right now it's at uh, at a relatively low area which is about 600 million cubic feet per day and but the expectation is as oil prices go back up and uh, as production continues to increase that we'll see you know we'll see levels rise to to this area if you will okay so the the term we use is um, is associated gas so associated gas is the methane that comes out of uh, oil well production and it's it comes as a byproduct if you want to think of it that way and typically the producer is looking at just capturing the oil and the the gas comes along with it so it's called uh, associated gas so what can we do with associated gas all right so one option is we can take that gas and create electricity with it all right so if you look at most oil well production sites or fracking sites, there is a need for electricity. There is a need for what we call uh, production field, field production electricity. All right. So how can how how do producers do that today? All right. In some cases, in a lot of cases, frankly, it's diesel power generation units that are used in uh, to create the electricity. Electricity is going to be used for ancillary equipment. It's used for 
powering uh, various different things that are required in, in, in part of the production process or the fracking process, right? So you need that electricity uh, in, in some way. So uh, the most common way has been really just getting an engine out there, it's connected to a generator, and you truck in diesel, by the way, to, to power these generators. So for, for the producer itself, it's costly. It's something that they need to do to get the field electricity, and it's, it's, it's a necessity uh, as part of the production process. When you do this, you, what you do is you're creating, frankly, a double dip. And what we mean by that is that you are flaring the gas, and then now you are take it takes the energy and effort to create that diesel first of all you know by uh, refining and so forth and then you come out and then you come burn it again to create uh, to create this electricity so flaring and and it, you know flaring as well as finding another way to create electricity it's it's creating the I won't say the same amount, but it's creating uh, uh, double the amount of uh, uh, emissions that uh, you, you could have if you were somehow to use that associated gas. So the term that's used uh, very often is emissions intensity. OK, and what that is, these the emissions for the unit output, OK, compared to flaring. So if you flare, you're just burning it off and there's no use of that that energy, if you will. You're just burning it off and it goes off into the atmosphere as CO2. If you if you burn it in this case, it, that you know, this product that's coming out of the ground, you're burning it and you're doing something with it. That is that uh, uh, that improvement that you're getting. You're, you're basically uh, getting something out of burning that uh, that gas that you would otherwise just burn off and do nothing with right so what solar has come up with is uh is a uh, a trailer package like this as you can see and what we have what we call it is our smt60 which stands for sobel solar mobile turbo machinery and it utilizes our taurus 60 turbine in it and so the idea behind this is how can we have an efficient and cost effective way for producers to be able to burn off that gas, create electricity without having all the infrastructure. So if you think about it, if you go out into an oil field or production site, all right, again, we said electricity is required and typically you would have the, uh, the uh, diesel powered uh, generator units out there, okay? But the other option is that, hey, you can have line power but if line power to get it to, and creating the infrastructure for that is very costly for uh, you know for all areas frankly uh, around the around the globe so there's got to be a, a more cost effective way of doing that and that's what we've come up with here so what we have here is a single trailer that can be taken from site to site as needed and and for fracking type operations, you know, you can look at like a six week to two month type operation and then moves on and so forth. So you don't really want to build out the full infrastructure if that's not uh, if that's not required. If you can have something that can move, that's preferred. Right. So we came up with this type of design. Of course, the tr the truck wouldn't be included, but just the trailer, as you see here, and it's a fully integrated design. It's one unit that would go to site. Okay, that does have a hydraulic leveling system. So once you get it to site, you can uh, you can set it up. Uh, it only has three main connections to it. So you have the gas fuel that would come in. You'd have the Black Star generator to get it going initially, and then you'd have the connections from the trailer itself to the high line, which is the power lines that would uh, provide electricity for the rest of the uh, for the production site. And when I say production site, it's not necessarily just that site where they're doing the electrical uh, production. It can be spread out over miles, if you will, depending on what kind of high lines the producer has decided and the amount of fields that uh, they're responsible for. Okay, What's nice about this is there's no alignment since it's a single trailer. Uh, there's no crane lifts required to put anything either on the top or on the sides or anything like that. It, it's all one unit. And so what that means is there's no feet off the ground and what and that means there's no pe there's nobody that has to climb on top of the trailer or um, you know get on top of any additional ancillary equipment 
to connect to this. Everything can be done with feet on the ground. This shows a this uh, picture actually shows a better description of of or a better visual of what's actually inside this trailer. So here you can see on the right side here you can see our turbine and uh, the exhaust systems associated with it and then the generator uh, in in this section here. In the front end of this is where we have our electrical compartment where you have the uh, switch gear and so forth that would be um, taking your the created electricity and transferring it to the uh, to the high line and the connections are would be like right here if you can imagine that all right so this is where the connections would give, go where the customer would tie directly to their high line and uh, and off it goes so a very very uh, efficient clean package and it's all in uh, one unit as you can see here we do have uh, it is a Solonox, what we call a gas fuel system so it's it can take uh, 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 you know, uh, methane straight in or fuel gas uh, straight in, but we also have an option for dual fuel such that you can have uh, diesel if initially you need to have diesel to get the power going and then eventually change over to, to methane, to, to fuel gas. A little bit more detail on what we have for the, uh, the product itself. Um, it is powered, like I mentioned before, with our Taurus 60 uh, engine. It's, uh, this is an engine that we've been manufacturing, a gas turbine that we've been manufacturing for, for many, many years. It's a proven product. It's, um, it's uh, well uh, accepted in our industry. And so it has a great track record. So we thought it would be uh, uh, you know, the right product to get in uh, uh, for this, uh, this type of uh, mobile power unit. All right. It uh, one thing that I mentioned before is I, I talked about fi uh, field gas. So this is raw gas that's coming out of the ground. So one of the one of the concerns or issues that comes up with that is that you have a, a, a quite a variety of field gas uh, of composition of that gas, if you will. Obviously, the majority is methane, but you'll have various components in there, and depending on the component gas components and so forth, it can cause it can cause issue. There's a term called the Wabi index, which talks about the 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 uh, gas intensity, if you will, the fuel density, the 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 heat content of the gas. And uh, what's what's really great about this system is that it has a really wide uh, fuel flexibility um, as built into the the design of this thing. So as a result of that, you can use uh, straight up methane if it's available. You can use whatever gas that's coming out of the ground, which is really the key purpose here. So instead of flaring, using that gas and off you go. OK, so this is um, it's very easy to move around, as we've discussed. Uh, it is um, uh, it is uh, uh, for the US and, and Canada. It's a it's a Department of Transportation uh, compliant, meaning it can be taken on all our, our on all our freeways and so forth and, and move uh, move about. Um, I, I was going to talk about it in the next slide, but I'll mention it here too. This product that we're looking at, I mean, it was primarily built uh, or initially built, I should say, for North America. And when we started introducing this product out, and it's been out for a couple of years now, um, there's been a lot of interest for this product uh, in other parts of the world. So we are currently looking um, and again, when I say targeted, it was it was North American target, so the U.S. and Canada primarily. But now we have uh, projects and an interest that's going on more so in Canada. We have some project uh, activity that's going on in 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 Egypt. Uh, we've got project activity that's going in Guatemala and South America. So a lot of interest uh, in in the uh, world for this uh, product because it can be it can be utilized for that. And so we're looking at more and more ways to create, make it more global, if you will, and uh, come up with uh, different uh, requirements for certification and so forth. Okay. So I didn't, uh, I didn't have any case studies, but here's a great uh, picture of a site that where we have this installed currently. All right. So right now, and just for uh, for your information. We've um, we've sold uh, over 22 units at this point, and we've got uh, what in what's in the works right now. Another 12 that we're looking at. So there's a lot of 
uh, opportunities. There's been a lot of acceptance for this uh, type of product. So here you can see uh, exactly what we were trying to achieve, which is getting the gas from the ground, getting it up to the high line that you see here. So you can see the gas coming in uh, on this line right here. There is some heating and conditioning that's going on in this section here. And then the gas is, is taken right into the uh, trailers. And uh, this is where we're creating, of course, the electricity. And it goes off to the high line. And the high line is now cr created for this, um, uh, for this power grid, if you will, this limited power grid for the, for, for the production sites or for what the uh, producer is working on. So very good example of how this would be laid out and uh, shows how, um, how, you, how the insta installation would look. Depending on the requirements for the electric electricity consumption requirements, you can see we have two trailers here. We have uh, other sites that have three, uh, other sites that have four. So it depends on really what the requirement is for the producer, and we can uh, have the appropriate number of trailers as a result of that. And uh, that's uh, primarily all I have for this presentation. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, we do have some uh, uh, time for questions later, and uh, we'll uh, we'll go from there. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Jonathan, I think you're on mute. Hit too many buttons too many there. Buttons Thanks, there. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, we've already got some questions popping up in the. Jonathan, I think you went back on mute and somehow. OK, somebody muted me. Because <laughs> I didn't touch anything. Let me, I'm going to take control again. Carefully. There we go. All right. Um, there, are uh, there are questions showing up in the chat box. Chat That's box. great. Keep them coming. I'm trying to keep a record of some of them. If I if I see them all, um, and, I'll, and I'll get to that when we get to the question and answer session. Um, but um, so keep posting those in there. The next presenter is Doug Sam from TP Midstream. Um, Jay, can you go on mute? I'm getting reverb from you. There we go. Thank you. Uh, is Doug Sam from TP Midstream. Uh, Doug has a variety of experience across different sectors of the defense and energy industries. Uh, he began his career working for the Department of Energy at Los Alamos National Laboratory in the stockpile manufacturing and support group, after which he spent two years with a medical technology startup and then went to work as a consultant for automation and prototype testing for a laser manufacturer. Doug then re-entered the energy industry in 2011, joined the Pipeline Services Division of TD Williamson. This business unit specializes in pipeline cleaning and support for the TDW inline inspection division. In this role, he saw gaps in the market and the value of temporary equipment company that could support the pipeline industry. Since leaving TDW, he founded in 2013 and now leads TPE Midstream. He is the inventor of the ZVAC technology and enjoys continuously pushing the company to new heights while leaving a lasting positive impact in the natural gas industry. Doug earned his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Illinois and currently holds his professional engineering license in Oklahoma for mechanical engineering. And with that, Doug, uh, if you could take control and we'll go from there. Sure thing. Thank you, Jonathan. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with this group. Uh, we've been involved with the Natural Gas Star and the Methane Challenge EPA programs for some time and look forward to this opportunity to bring our message and, and hopefully some awareness out to a broader set of people. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, it, it's a small community that really cares about this issue. And one of our big goals is to bring more people into the community of, of folks that are actually doing something about this. So what I'm going to discuss today is really a programmatic approach to eliminating venting. Um, 
we manufacture some equipment that supports that called the ZVAC. But, but our real goal is to enable, enable gas operators to get their field operations in alignment with their ambitions, their, their, what they want to do environmentally uh, versus what actually happens <clears throat> out in the dirt. And, you know, what that, what we hope that looks like someday is a, a day where every single employee can go do their job without releasing gas. So before we dive into this, the clarification that, that I want to make sure we all understand is the difference between venting from what I think most people think of as fugitive emissions. So what we're talking about are not leaks. They aren't um, accidents, you know, or, or unintended releases. These are the releases where someone goes out on purpose and opens a valve to do a blowdown, to depressurize a piece of equipment uh, or a whole pipeline. So where your leaks, you know, it might be considered a, a relatively severe leak if it's one cubic foot a minute, right, or, or 10 cubic feet a minute. That's a big leak. What we're talking about is, you know, um, 10,000 cubic feet a minute, right? It's orders of magnitude, more intense release, but it's intermittent and it's on purpose. It's usually in the name of maintenance of some kind, but there's actually a lot of places where this activity occurs. And so what we put forward is the ZVAC, which is an alternative. It's, it's a way to capture that and re-inject it. So to Jonathan's point earlier, the detection side of this business is really sexy. Satellites, you know, infrared, lasers, continuous monitor. It, it's amazing the technology that's out there. It, it is not going to get any less sexy than this. <laughs> this is the, um, the most basic step that people can take, which is, you know, look at how hard it is to find methane once it's released and then track it down and then let alone do something about it, right? What, after it's released, it's very hard. Uh, what we propose is just don't release it and, and do not release it on purpose, right? So just some clarification. But when we talk about venting, it's happening all the time and it's on purpose. This is intentional stuff. It's in the name of maintenance. And this is really important maintenance. This is the kind of work that has to happen every day to keep the systems operational and to keep them safe. So everything from taking an entire transmission high pressure pipeline out of service for maintenance, those are those are large projects, large events, they're planned um, typically, but it doesn't happen that often. As you move across this curve, you get down to meters residential right these are these are things that get maintained every day you might have a a single city a single utility that replaces 50,000 meters a year those people are doing these releases 10 times a day it's a much smaller magnitude of, of emission but they're doing it all the time and the issue there is that this affects your culture. This affect these are in someone's home, right? That this is happening. So this has a huge impact on the public as well as your own workforce. And, and the key thing here is you don't have to go search for these. These activities, there's already a technician mobilizing to this site. They're, they're going to go do this on purpose as part of their job. So why are we focused on venting? We're, we're not chasing leaks. Um, and, and one of the big reasons is because we believe that of all the scope one emissions that are out there, venting is highly likely to be regulated 
and and possibly banned. Uh, that's speculation on my part, but what what we believe is that you know the the emissions that come from power generation or vehicles um, or even leaks, while they're all going to be addressed and worked toward, it's very hard to at the same time allow intentional releasing, right? So there's a, for, as, a as a someone in the mindset of a legislator, how, how can I force someone to go spend all this effort retrofitting all this equipment and all these facilities, but at the same time, it's okay to just go out there and release it as part of your standard operation. So we believe this will happen. There's there's precedent in the refrigerants um, for releases being uh, banned. But there's actually a lot of other reasons. Even if you disagree and you say, oh, that'll never happen, there's actually a lot of reasons to focus on venting. And the first is it's actionable instantly. You, you already know where they all are. Every venting blowdown that an operator performs, they already know where it is because they're sending someone to go do it. Uh, and they're very low cost to mitigate because of that. <clears throat> you're already mobilizing. You're already sending people to the site. You're already um, going out there to do some operation. So a lot of the cost and time is already in. So we'll talk about the difference between doing that operation and doing it without a blowdown and the difference is negligible. There's also some safety issues around venting. Um, you, anytime you release uh, hydrocarbon into the air, you have a fuel air mixture. And in the case of blowdowns and venting, you have people there. So anyone who's spent any time in the field knows that you go to great lengths to prevent any ignition source even if you're not venting. So there's a strong safety case to be made that, that venting has a safety implication that you know can be addressed here. We, we spoke about the regulation. There's also this other, the people side of this issue. And the people side is really your public relations and the, the credibility that we carry as an industry is dependent on doing what we say we're going to do. So when we're out there as an industry pushing these messages of we're going to be sustainable, this is clean energy. You know, we are pushing this message, but at the same time, we're telling people, our own workers, yeah, we are doing that, but I still need you to go out and vent this. I still need you to blow things down every day to do your job that's a really hard thing to manage as a public relations issue. And it's also hard internally for a company to try to change their culture. That's probably the hardest thing a company can undertake is shifting a culture. And so when you have these aspirational ESG ambitions that don't line up with what you're telling your workforce to do every day, it creates a cultural disconnect that's really hard to overcome. So that's why we're focused on venting. Now, here's here's where the rubber meets the road. So how do you begin to tackle this? And what we propose was developed in conjunction with um, Campos EPC is an impact-based approach. So Anyone who's worked in integrity management or uh, safety systems will understand a risk-based approach, right? So in a risk-based approach, you list every single thing, every asset or every operation you have, and then you score them based on a bunch of risk factors and you address the riskiest issues first. In an impact-based approach, we take a very similar structure. We First, list every single application where venting occurs. This could be everything from pipe repair to meter maintenance to odorization to LR, right? You use your satellites and your, your cameras and you find a leak. 
what's the next thing that happens? You have, you should fix the league, right? So to fix the league, a lot of times you have to blow down the asset that you're fixing. So this is right a disconnect, and it happens all the time. So most operators have a have a manual of procedures. You can scan these procedures. You can build this list, and then we will rank these on impact. So we'll say, how often does it happen? Frequency. How big is the release every time it happens? That's what we call magnitude. How much does it impact the public? Right? Is it is it urban or rural? You know, how conflicting is it with our corporate culture? Are there safety implications? Your your operator may have a whole slew of these these risk these impact factors but ultimately we're going to rank order them we're going to score everything and, and put them in an order that shows us which are the applications where the impact is to address it so once we've done that we're going to say okay now let's look at all those applications and let's just list out what could we do about this we could do we could do it less often, right? We could make less frequency. We could drop the volume, right? So we could use stopples or or close more valves to, to release less. We could drop the pressure before we do it. We could flare it. We could z back it. We could do any number of techniques to address each one. But you've got to get these things organized. And so once you've listed all your applications, you've ranked them, and then you've identified what you could possibly do to address it, then you're gonna build your program. And this is why we call it an impact-based approach that it's, it's a programmatic approach, not terribly different from a safety program or an integrity management program. But we're gonna take our top 20% of those most impactful applications and we're going to put our effort there, right? The, the vast majority of our effort goes toward those biggest impact issues. And we'll launch our pilot programs to evaluate those solutions we identified. So as you go through this process, you work your way from most impactful, that's where you spend the most effort, down to least impactful, where you don't put as much effort, you still probably should look at them, but you're trying to get the most impact for the effort. And then you're going to move this year after year towards your goals. So everything up till then, till this, is really um, an exercise in the office, right? There's probably field personnel involved. You haven't actually gone out and, and done anything yet. And this is really when the pilot projects happen. So if you have identified that a band, you know, blowdowns, pipeline blowdowns, cleaning, valve replacement, you, you'll have identified your highest impact applications. Well, now let's pick some really specific projects. What pipelines are we going to be blowing down in January, right, or February? Uh, it's going to be line 325A. Okay, let's look at that project. Let's identify some KPIs or metrics. Let's write a procedure to go do this without blowing it down. We'll have to train some people and, and work on it, but we can go do this. And when we do this project in this structured approach, we will get the data back to be able to come on out the other end of that project with knowledge and insight on how we can address that type of application across our system. This is when you go execute, right? You go to the field. This is where we come into this process and we say, we can help. We have the equipment. We've done this before. Uh, we can train your people. Uh, and ultimately, what we're going to do is go to that vent where you were going to do your blowdown, and we're going to capture and re-inject that blowdown instead. 
So this is where I want to pause our impact-based approach, which we'll come back to, and talk a little bit about the ZVAC. It's an acronym for Zero Emission Vacuum and Compressor. It, it's a tool that transfers gas and liquids that would otherwise be vented. So what we do is connect to the vent stack or the pipe, and then we have to take a discharge connection onto another part of the system or something adjacent. When you turn on the machine, it pumps the gas from one to the other until it's depressurized and empty. This is not sexy. This is a blue box that is a compressor transfer pump. You know, Jonathan, you made a point earlier about, about that the detection side is just sexy. I have been asked, is it autonomous? I said, well, it, it's a pump, so sure. And, and they said, well, I wanna, I wanna put it into my capital request as an autonomous thing. And, and so it's kind of a joke that, that a lot of the methane mitigation is not that sexy, but it actually matters because when humans have to go into a corporate culture and, and request money or, or resources to do something, that sexiness matters. So we'll, um, we're trying to help it seem sexy, but really this is just the most simple uh, application of keeping it in the pipe to begin with so you don't have to deal with it later. Uh, you can learn a lot more about the equipment itself on our website. I don't want to spend this valuable time going too deep into the equipment, but it, you know, we regularly do distribution applications, which are, you know, 55 PSI and lower, all the way up to storage applications at, you know, 2200 PSI. So there's a huge pressure range that we're capable of dealing with. We can take it all the way to 0, 0.0 PSI in, in select applications. We actually intentionally perform vacuum operation um, to, to even eliminate the atmospheric pressure from being ever released. So the tool is highly versatile. It's super easy to use in the field. That's been our whole uh, slant as a company since the beginning. But where most people really start adopting ZVAC is when they realize that the increase in time and effort and money to do the same work without venting is almost negligible. It's almost 0% of whatever their project was before. So if you're going to go do a new pipeline, or you're going to do um, an inline inspection, the costs of those projects are already established and they're very high. The cost of doing that same project while recovering the gas and pushing it back in the line, it doesn't move the needle. It's a rounding error in the project cost typically. As a former field operator, I care very deeply about making this easy for the humans who actually go do this work to execute. Um, there are no electronics. There, are, there's not even batteries. Uh, this is a, you know, a device that any field technician can operate, and typically after they've been shown how to do it once, they've got it. So back to our structured approach. This is where I think it gets really interesting. The cost of abatement after it's released, after that methane is released, there's really no current option other than carbon offsets that I know of. After that is in the atmosphere, 
that's the only way to address it. So I, I took a stab at this and I said, let's say you have a workforce, a crew, a maintenance crew who's responsible for releasing about 2 million cubic feet a year at a 10 year average of $40 a ton of CO2, right? These are guesses on my part. Here's what that's gonna cost me to deal with. If my maintenance crew continues to release 2 million cubic feet a year, it's gonna cost me about half a million dollars, that's USD a year. If I outfit that same crew with a ZVAC machine, I'm gonna carry the upfront cost of the equipment for the first seven years, and after that, it's just the O&M cost. And I'm already ahead. It's cheaper to abate my methane by using this equipment than it is to do carbon offsets. Plus, I keep the product. So I'm keeping $5 a ton of CO2e at, at that $40 rate. I'm keeping that product. That's not assigning any value to safety, public relations, cultural alignment, the corporate benefits. And so in this scenario, you're looking at an abatement cost of $25 to $30. Now, that's 2 million cubic feet a year. So for those of you to put this in a different reference, that's 13 miles of 12 inch pipe or you know, 175 40 foot joints of 18 inch. You know, that could come in a lot of different forms, but ultimately this is not a lot of blowdown gas. There are maintenance crews who do multiples of that. They might blow down a 13 mile piece of 12 inch for one project. They might do that much gas release in a day. When you look at this on a maintenance crew that does a lot of blowdowns, it gets staggering. So even if you had to give them two machines to address all their venting, this is what it looks like. The key drivers to getting that abatement cost down are high tool utilization and a limited number of assets to do it with. So this is why we really advocate a tool-based approach instead of a facility-based approach. Because if you looked at how many places in my system is there a vent valve, there's thousands, thousands and thousands of them. On the other hand, there's only so many working crews. So if I equip my crews with a tool, I get every facility that they go to. And in our structured approach, when we get to the end and we have phased rollout of, of this new standard practice, that's when we can make announcements that aren't aspirational. It's factual. We don't do this anymore. And, and that's really powerful uh, when you're talking about access to capital and sustainable investing. To summarize, by deploying ZVAC, you get instant impact. This is a short spin up. The technicians can be trained and deployed immediately. And the very first time you use it, you have a public relations and an ESG opportunity to promote what you're doing. On the other side, the sustainable returns come from not just capital recovery, but alignment of your culture. And the two big things are, even if you agree that abatement is a cost-effective method, right? we're gonna buy offsets, that's our plan. Well, that might make all the sense in the world at $10 a ton. What if it's 40? What if it's $140 a ton, right? What if they force us to use the 20-year methane equivalency instead of 100? and I now have an 80x multiplier, Those that carbon pricing uncertainty gets removed if you don't release it and then have to offset it. Even if you disagree with the pricing argument, even if emissions stay at $10 a ton, they might make intentional venting illegal, right? That's a possible thing that could happen. So you can remove a lot of those concerns and, and uncertainty over the long haul by using these tools, equipping your workforce and keeping it in the pipe. 
So I, I'm out of time, but I appreciate the opportunity. Please don't hesitate to reach out and, and get in touch. Uh, we'd love to work with you all to to equip your workforce and put the word blow down into the history books. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Doug. Doug. So, 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 and Doug, if you could mute, getting some reverb there. Um, great, thanks. So we're now to the question and answer session discussion. Um, there's been quite a few comments and questions posted in the chat, and I've been keeping track of those. Um, if you would like to ask a question uh, out loud, um, there's the hand raising option um, up at the top. You just click on the little uh, high five sign um, and I'll try to keep track of uh, folks that have their hands up so that uh, I can call on you. And then you just simply need to unmute uh, to speak. And then after you've asked your question, please mute. Um, when you do ask a question verbally, say who you are, who you're with, and you know, direct your question to one of the speakers, if you don't mind. Um, and um, let's see. Um, trying to see. Let's see. Where did the hand person go? Uh, I saw someone raise their hand. Let's see. I know someone had their hand up. <laughs> Sam, can you see who had their hand up? Um, I don't believe, based on what I can see, that anyone has their hand raised at the moment. That may have been um, an accidental hand raise, but. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Um, well, I mean, while people are waiting to uh, ask questions, let me. Um, Let's see. All right. Grant uh, raised their hand. Grant, do you want to ask a question? Hi, can you hear me OK? Yes, go ahead. Uh, this is uh, Professor Grant Walk, Dalhousie University in, in Canada. It's uh, this was a very technical presentation, but very good. But I perhaps wanted to get the opinions of the committee on what thoughts are in terms of uh, the offset of carbon credits versus a carbon tax. What might be uh, more preferable for the industry based on the various jurisdictions? Over. Do you guys have a uh, want to chime in on that? Uh, anyone uh, on the GMI subcommittee want to chime in on that one? Yeah, it's James here. So um, I, I, maybe I'll, I'll deflect it rather than chime in on it. I think um, so. So Grant, I, like I, I think I think absolutely you, you're right. Uh, and and within the subcommittee perspective, you know, the idea of understanding financing, financial implications, and and drivers for action is something that we have explored and, and would continue to explore. I think uh, session to session, we've tried to um, fo focus attention, I guess, focus focus on on, on different aspects of, of the issues around methane emission mitigation. And certainly as we brought this panel together, it was really about some technical solutions. So I, I could say we'll uh, obviously are recording this and, and uh, let's pick it up in another session because I, I think it's something that we will be exploring in more detail. So. And as a federal regulator in Canada, <laughs> you know everything's on the table. That's what I would say, right? I mean, uh, it's a, it's a, certainly a hot a hot topic. So, you know, I'm just reviewing the uh, CCUS options for the Energy Sustainable Committee for the UN. So uh, these are all timely presentations. So thanks very much, guys. Appreciate it. Nice work. Thanks, Grant. Thanks, James. Um, let me throw out a, a couple of questions. Um, uh, let's see. Um, ones that came in through uh, the chat for for Jay, um, I'm going to give you uh, 
three questions. Happy to repeat them if uh, if you forget, because I usually forget. When somebody asks me three questions, I usually forget the, the first two and only answer the third. Um, so uh, happy to repeat them if, if you're uh, suffering from the same uh, uh, issues that I do. Um, first, what, the question that came in on the chat was, uh, what is the maximum volume of gas that one unit, uh, one SMT60 can handle? Um, and the other question was in the trailer, how do you do the black start? Um, the other question was, how do you deal with the challenge of significant drop in gas production due to high decline rates? So those are questions for you, Jay. Okay, very good. Those are all actually excellent questions. Um, so the, for the first one, uh, when we look at the uh, the amount of gas uh, consumption, if you will, in the SMT60, and you know the 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 one thing I found interesting is when we were trying to put some of this data together, what are the units that people use? Because what I found in different sectors of our oil and gas industry, people use different terms. So I'm going to try to use terms that hopefully uh, we can all relate to. Um, and, and you know, typically it's in in the uh, 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 midstream world, it's BTUs. You know, we look at millions of uh, BTUs per day. Um, but if you look at um, uh, an SMT60, if you're running at full production, producing 5.7 megawatt of power, which is what uh, what it's rated for, you know, you're looking at about 1,100 uh, standard cubic feet per minute, which translates to about 64,000 uh, standard cubic feet per hour which translates to 1,536,000 uh, standard cubic feet per day. Okay, so about 1.5 uh, million uh, standard cubic feet per day. So that is the amount of when you're running at full production or meaning at full electricity requirement, that's what the, uh, that's what the SMT60 would use. Okay, uh, the other question, uh, actually it's unrelated, but I think it's an important one to, to talk about. If you were to use the equivalent amount of diesel for that same type of uh, production, that amounts to about 437 gallons per hour, okay? To just give you perspective uh, compared to using uh, gas, if you will. All right, next question was about the Black Star generator. So a Black Star generator is used to initially get the unit going, get the turbine going and, and running. And uh, that is typically uh, diesel powered. Okay. Now, again, that means you have to bring diesel in, but I just gave you the number of how much it would be to run this. And we're talking a fraction, a very, very small fraction of that amount to get that Black Star generator, typically in the tens of gallons, if you will. Okay. And then I guess the last question was significant drop of gas. Again, a very, very good question. So as you get, as field production happens, what will happen is uh, there's, uh, as the fields go down, your gas, the amount of gas that comes out of the ground, your associated gas is going to reduce, all right? So as a result of that, um, you're, you won't be able to provide the full requirement for that turbine to go full bore to create 5.7 megawatt. So what it means is that you will be running at a reduced load. So you can still run it, you can still pro uh, create electricity, but it won't be at that 5.7 megawatt level. Okay, I think that answers all three, Jonathan. Well done. Okay. <laughs> You've passed your, uh, your memory exam. Um, no. Not really. Not All gonna, I did was I wrote them down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to make any any jokes uh, on memory tests. Um, uh, let me uh, throw out a question um, uh, to Sean um, and a, a couple of questions. Um, first, um, uh, what are the power requirements for the recompression system? Um, and then. Um, and then I had a question myself. Um, you 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 were talking about um, the CO two E uh, calculations are specified um, uh, through the, the system. Um, can you also specify uh, if you're if you're going from methane to CO two E? Can you also specify which uh, global warming potential you you use? Uh, for those calculations, or is that something that's just um, this that's built in? So, uh, turn to you, Sean. 
Thank you for those questions. So on the first one with regards to the power requirements uh, for our dry seal recompression system, uh, the power uh, of the motors are at 20 horsepower and 40 horsepower. Um, but most of the time in operation from how we size them to ensure that we have capacity, um, you're normally running about uh, half that. So you're actually using about 10 horsepower or 20 horsepower. Uh, for our process and recompression uh, system, that comes with a 75 horsepower motor. Um, and we normally are consuming uh, somewhere around uh, 40 to 50 horsepower when actually running in the field. So, um, and we, uh, on our dry seals, we do run on um, uh, VFDs to try to match the leaks of the dry seals so to optimize the energy efficiency and reduce any recycling or excess energy that's being used to keep the OPEX um, down. Um, on the CO2E, uh, when solar turbines uh, ships it out of our factories, we put in um, a multiplier of 25, but that's a tunable constant that can be used and adjusted um, by any user um, overall. And it has the flexibility even um, if a actual, um, I'll say, a currency rate wants to be implemented per, per volume, that can be utilized too. That's just um, a, a standard uh, feature that gets kicked out as a, as a default, but we can change it so it's uh, applicable to the region and the user and what they're trying to achieve. Fantastic, thanks, Sean. Um, and then I gotta go see, uh, Sam, you need to jump in. Sorry, yes. Um, just in the interest of time, I know this session is supposed to close at 1030 um, uh, Eastern Standard Time, so um, we may might have time for one more quick question, but otherwise I'm happy to um, follow up with our speakers uh, with the remaining unanswered questions. Great. Let me let me throw one more out there um, uh, for Doug um, that came in over the chat um, and and that was um, the ZBEC system uh, it appears to be focused on non-routine periodic intention venting. Um, the um, the question though was, uh, is the system able to handle intentional routine venting, continuous purposeful venting from normal operations? Doug, you're still there. Thanks. <laughs> oh, yeah, there great question. <laughs> We have uh, we have hundreds of these machines out in field operation, and they get placed into a tremendous variety of situations. Most, I would say, 97, 98 percent of our applications are intermittent use. So it's it's definitely routine. It's multiple releases a day, but it is not continuous duty 24/7. A handful of applications, uh, they've been put into that service and are generally, you know, it, it's fine. It's not necessarily the most thermodynamically efficient way to tackle those things that are constant and low flow. It's really tuned and it's optimal for those intermittent type applications. So occasionally we'll get put into a you know, continuous duty application, everything works, you know, no problem, but it's really not the design intent. Great. Thank you, Doug. Um, I had a lot of other questions that came in uh, for you also on the um, in the chat box, but uh, we are running out of time. I want to thank the speakers, uh, Doug, uh, Sean, and, and Jay, uh, much appreciated. Um, and I will turn this back over to uh, James. Thanks, Jonathan. And to respect people's time, I'll definitely try and run through this last minute just to, to wrap things up uh, and echo what you said. You know, Doug, Sean, uh, Jay, thank you very much for putting on display some some real solutions. I think that's exactly um, a, um, a key role that the committee can place as a, you know, a meeting place for uh, solution providers and, and, and people who need those solutions. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, for your 
you know, overarching perspective on, on the issue right now and, and you know, the role that we can play in putting this meeting place together. Um, and we're not done, I guess, as I wrap this up. Uh, so we, we, this is a series that will continue uh, and, and um, certainly looking forward to bringing together people again in a couple of weeks. Um, I would remind people that uh, we have recorded this. Uh, the, the decks will be available on the website. So uh, it's impossible to get this right in terms of managing, uh, managing the right time, but uh, virtual meeting space seems to be and they right sized at an hour to an hour and a half. So there's lots of questions. Don't don't stop them. Uh, reach out to to me and to the committee. Uh, reach out to the speakers and whose uh, information has been presented, and will be posted on site. Um, the uh, idea of, of more uh, more webinars coming up. So we've talked about uh, back to the first question. The idea of some financial aspects. Um, cost curves for mission mission uh, abatement technologies, LDARs, uh, another area out there, emergence policies is something else we'll get. Um, and lastly, thank you very much for being here today. So we'll close it down now. Uh, stay in touch, everybody, and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Watch for the emails.